Hello and welcome to Nimsy Live. My name is Tucker Johnson and this is our great comeback tour. We haven't been doing this for a little while. It's been a little while since we've we've seen each other here. So welcome back. Today we are talking about the nine categories of language technology. Each plays an important role for mature localization. There is no better guest to have on the show to discuss these complex topics than our guest today. My name is Tucker Johnson, and you are experiencing NIMSY Live. NIMSY Live is where we talk about the latest and greatest in translation, localization, internationalization, culturalization, and all that fun stuff going global. Our tagline is Real Talk with Global Thought Leaders. And on this program, we invite guests who like to have fun and who also have some value to add for our audience of globalization professionals. So please keep us honest and let us know what you'd like to see more of on this program. We are live, which means that you can talk directly with us via the comments on whatever platform you are watching on. We are on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, where we are hosting a LinkedIn event. Keep an eye open for future LinkedIn events and follow NIMSY Insights there to make sure that you get to know ahead of time when we go live. In our talk today, we are looking at the main categories of the language technology landscape, and we are going to discuss what you need to know about each of them for a modern globalization program. These nine categories are translation business management systems, translation management systems, integrators or middleware, quality management, including terminology, management systems, machine translation, virtual interpreting technology or VIT, speech recognition systems, audiovisual translation tools or AVT, and marketplaces and platforms. But before we get into that, a little bit of housekeeping. If you aren't already subscribed to NIMSY Insights, then please do so. Now is your chance. If you're watching this and you hit that subscribe or follow button, then you will be the first to be notified when we have new live streams or when NIMSY Insights publishes new research. Also, if you're not aware of the work that we're doing over at Multilingual Magazine, go check that out, especially Multilingual TV. We have a host of sister programs over there on their YouTube channel. Channel, such as the Venn Diagram with Michael Reed, Te Epe with Juan Ma Lopez, High Performance Leaders with Andrew Smart, Open World with the Terra Localization Team where they talk about gaming localization, Malavlados with Javi, and a host of webinars such as the Season Series webinars. If any of these programs sound interesting, go on over to MLTV by searching for Multilingual Media on YouTube and subscribe to that channel after subscribing to NIMSY of course. Last piece of housekeeping here before we get into it. A uh, new quick segment I'd like to include on the show is taking a look at industry events that are upcoming. There are great calendars available from both NIMSY and Multilingual Magazine, and here we're going to take a look at the one from NIMSY Insights here. And give me one second. Yeah, this is a great calendar. If you're not aware of this, go on over to nimsy.com forward slash event, and you can filter by event types, event location. Uh, we got a couple happening today, actually. We have the DigiMarcon, which is a global global marketing event, happening today. Uh, global Saki coming up, and a DigiMarcon coming up as well. I'll, I'll spare you the details on these. Oh, here's some details for DigiMarcon. Um, August 25th, that's today. You guys are too late, I'm sorry. Um, I'll spare you the details, but please do go over and check that out at nimsy.com forward slash events. All right, now that we've gotten all that out of the way, let's meet our guest today. Yulia Kokova is the foremost expert in the field of language technology categorization and evaluation. She is the lead researcher responsible for mapping and categorizing, categorizing over 750 technologies in the 2021 NIMSY Language Technology Landscape Report. That is a mouthful. She is also the longest-serving honey badger. I, Yulia, I, as I was writing your intro the other day, I, are you the longest-term NIMSY employee here? I believe you are. Oh, I have Yulia muted. I, I'm sorry, Yulia. I had you muted. I believe you're the longest term NIMSY employee, correct? That's me. Yeah. That's you. So NIMSY is no no stranger to, or Yulia is no no stranger to NIMSY. She's she's been around for a little bit here. 
the NIMSI Language Technology Atlas, uh, it highlights extensive research that NIMSI uses to guide our clients through complex technology selection, deployment, and migration projects. Navigating these 700 plus technology solutions can be daunting. If you want to benchmark the various available technologies, get expert advice and recommendations on tools that are best suited to your needs, or obtain an independent assessment of the choice you already made, contact NIMSI's team of technology specialists like Yulia today. All right, Miss Yulia, now I, that, that was a long intro. I'm sorry for that, and thank you for being patient. Thank you for joining us today. How are you? Thank you. I'm very happy to be here, obviously. I, I am very happy to have you too, and I'm very happy to have all of these lovely people over here joining us on LinkedIn. Looks like we have 48 people joining us, and the chat is going wild. So, guys, um, thank you very much for participating in the chat. I wasn't expecting that. We're going to try our best to get to all of those, but let's kick it off. Uh, Yulia, category number one. Translation management systems. Let's dive right in here. We, we talked about the nine different categories here in the, the Language Technology Atlas, and um, we're starting with translation management systems. Let me just see if I can pull up a copy of the Atlas here. And if you're following along at home, if you're over on the LinkedIn profile, there's a comment. There's a pinned comment there that um, you should be able to access this yourself. There we go. Correct. Yes. So we have in the top left corner here, translation management systems, um, in addition to the other nine integrators, machine translation, TPMSs, marketplaces, audiovisual, interpreting, quality management, and speech recognition. Um, talking about TMSs, let's start off with a, with a softball here. What does TMS stand for? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Loud and clear. Yes, ma'am. Oh, wonderful. Uh, that is a great question, actually. Not... Uh, kind of stupid question because as it happens just today we have received a comment from some great follower and uh, like uh, the lover of Nimzi research so far uh, on some of the social uh, channels where the uh, point of contact pointed out that hey guys consider including cat tools to your Nimzi language technology atlas and uh, well, here is the answer. We actually have, we have cat tools. How and how is it linked to TMS? Well, for that, we have a very nice piece of content, a uh, very fun one, same as like everything NIMSI does, <laughs> which uh, probably Tucker can also like uh, point to um, if needed. But uh, anyway, translation management system, how the concept evolved. So on paper, uh, that means really like something for managing translations, but like what this concept uh, has in it. First, like and foremost, um, the environment for actual translation, meaning the uh, translation work, the editing work, possibly a quality assurance procedures associated with that, and a translation memory, of course, which helps uh, this work not to be done in vain and store all the segments that are already uh, have already been uh, translated let's say so the tm is the core of a tms and indeed uh, some years ago when it all just emerged and we also have the piece on history of tms uh, just in case anyone's interested so uh, in like uh, 80s when this uh, whole category of systems emerged it was called exactly CAT tools, CAT tools, Computer Assisted Translation Tools or Computer Aided Translation. Both are okay and legit. And uh, so um, they had these features that I just mentioned, meaning a translation memory, quality assurance, a term base, yes. Um, further and later, also machine translation options were added to uh, such a CAT tool. But then with time, um, it was clear that, and or it became clear to all the parties involved in this fascinating translation process that it's just not enough. There is also something needed to manage the collaborative work of translators, of uh, editors, of the team. And uh, uh, this is how the translation management options and functionalities were added to the like uh, concept of a TMS. Tucker. 
Double check. Can you still hear me? I, I see I, some strange pictures. I can hear you just fine. I'm sorry. I, I've got pictures coming up all over the place here. I, I've I've lost this the screen here, but I, I've got you back. We can hear you. Oh, that's we, great. We can hear you just fine, Yulia. You you are on a roll. Keep going. Keep going. My, my, the, the main reason <laughs> okay. I wanted to talk about this was simply because I've heard terminology management system. I've heard um, terminology management system, TMS, which is, I don't think, an, a, a correct way to do it. Uh, there's translation management system, translation memory system. So there's all of these different things. But essentially, a TMS is something that helps you get your, trans, your stuff translated. Right. Um, it's just an all all in one or in theory. Anyways, it should be an all in one kind of workflow workflow solution f for you. But you also have on here translation management systems and broken down, of course, into localization for developers. Uh, let me go back over here. Localization for developers, uh, enterprise only TMS systems, uh, proxy versus JavaScript based website loc and updates on air and generic TMSs for everyday customer profiles. And right below this, we have translation business management systems. So maybe this is something that um, you can talk a little bit about, like what is the difference between translation business management systems and translation management yeah. systems here? With pleasure. There is a common uh, like misconception or not exactly a misconception, it's just a, a different way of naming different things. Okay. Um, so some actually call these systems, which we have in the yellow category there, Translation Business Management System, some call them TMS. Uh, so same as the um, upper green category. And that's where some kind of frustration sometimes uh, <laughs> happens and comes from. For example, if you try to Google some kind of a comparison of a TMS, resources such as, uh, well, not exactly super knowledgeable resources in language technology, I prefer not to name them. <laughs> <laughs> so they would uh, uh, combine uh, these concepts and, uh, for example, compare a typical TMS, let's say a MemoQ. Mm -hmm. This is a company, a very known one, well established, uh, older from the older generation of uh, TMS or MemSource or XTM, so would compare these TMS kinds of tools with, uh, let's say, Plunet or XTRF or, let's say, Consultech and their uh, flow fit, if I remember the name correctly, or Protemos, uh, which are actually translation business management systems. The main difference here is that they shouldn't be compared, actually, uh, as such, uh, because TBMS or BMS <laughs> Um, does not have the editing environment or translation oh, environment. Okay. It helps to manage translation projects and only that. Because if you, for example, are very lucky and you're in a situation where you just are uh, allowed to work in just one environment, yes, a TMS will be enough. For example, take SmartCat, do everything there. You can even pay your freelancers there. But if you're not that lucky and you have to deal with like 10 to 15 TMS daily, for example, you're working in an LSP, which respect respectively has different uh, clients who also have their TMS cho of choice. So in that case, you will need to have something unified, some kind of a way to actually manage all those projects coming in from different TMS and track it all. And that would be a task that the ATBMS would solve. Well, now I know. I, I've always I've always wondered that. So, is it is it safe to say? Is it like a, a silly, um, simple definition of it? It's like a TMS without a cat tool integrated into it. So, like a management system without the translation environment. Or is that? I, I see the look on your face, and you're like, no, Tucker, that's a drastic <laughs> like oversimplification of it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Well, all right. We've done translation management systems. We've talked about translation business management systems here. I want to go back because I, I skipped something that I wanted to talk about with translation management systems. So if you don't mind here, I would like to go back to um, TMSs. And I want to talk about interlanguage vector support, which was something that I was reading about in the, the report that, that was published that you wrote. And I have a quote here from Bob Williams, CEO of XTM. And Bob, if you're watching, hi. Bob's probably not watching, but maybe someone will tag him. Uh, this, is, this is a next evolution in talking once again about interlanguage vector support here. 
He says, this is a next evolution that language technology providers need to have some focus on. In interlanguage vector space, we draw on all available online data to calculate the probability of a target language word being an accurate translation of a source language word. It enables accurate forecasting of the human editing required post-machine translation, and that enables accurate prediction and control of cost at time scales. And once again, that is from Bob Williams, the CEO of X-Team International. Yulia, what the heck does that mean? Yeah, uh, happy to uh, like piggyback on what you just quoted. Um, if I like may say, uh, I would uh, probably mention here that in our industry, in the localization industry, uh, this concept, interlanguage vector space, is more uh, like pushed uh, by XTM themselves. Um, and this is great because they are a company, XTM Cloud or XTM International, um, they are a company that has uh, been successfully in experimenting in that area. However, to my knowledge, um, of course, which is limited, um, no other like major significant uh, TMS um, same as XTM, um, no other would, um, you know, like have some significant uh, experience to share um, in that area. And that is how, if you try to Google that, uh, please do, inter-language vector space, uh, most likely the comments, quotes, and articles from XTM themselves would pop up. Uh, from uh, my uh, own understanding, it all lies in the area of word-to-word -word alignment which corresponds to the quote you just like, uh, read out loud. And uh, the whole concept is, of course, not invented by XDM, uh, interlinked, which vector space, I mean, but they have kind of labeled it. And that's uh, what they use in such developments as, for example, uh, speedy terminology management and terminology harvesting and terminology gathering. Uh, so in general, I would say probably that it is a new neural uh, network-based technology that indicates the proximity between like uh, distant uh, source and target words within the segment which we are dealing with, which we are translating, for example. If we would like to have more uh, of an understanding like how it actually uh, corresponds to the vector idea, what's, of, what's vector space, because I just said what it is, but how exactly vectors are uh, yeah, yeah, Ilya, I just have yeah. to say, like, you lost me at, like, neural interconnected <laughs> dynamic something, but but keep going, keep going, yeah. because you may have lost me, but there's people watching that want to know. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, I will not be alone with that. I would just like to add to that super short explanation what it has to do with vector space. And for that, I will also quote one a very good resource, <laughs> resource sorry, which I read for, I think, 11 years from now, from the beginning of when I entered this uh, fascinating industry. So that would be the multilingual magazine, of course. And there we have this uh, like additional, uh, yeah, that one. <laughs> we have this additional explanation. Uh, possibly also it was like written uh, by the XTM fellows, which is brilliant. So, um, one paragraph, let me read it out loud. ILVS, Interlanguage Vector Space, is a neural network based technology framework uh, that is able to work out relationships between words and how close their meanings are to one another. Well, that's basically what I said, but here is what's interesting. Each word is associated with a mathematical vector of 300 values which uniquely describes the word within the corpus and its relationship with other words. It's if every word is represented with its own unique fingerprint. The resultant word-based data structures for the corpus are known as vector spaces. I like this uh, definition very much because I think it uh, uh, gives us better understanding what vectors have to do with it and what is the vector space. And I also like this analogy with the fingerprint of a word. I think now it becomes a little bit clearer for us and for our audience. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to respond to that. How do you, how do you feel? You want to talk about machine translation, which is coming up next, or do you want to get into some questions from the comments? Uh, whatever suits us best, uh, we can jump into machine translation or 
better give our audience some uh, attention. Yeah, let's give them some love here. <laughs> yeah. They're they're blowing up over here. So uh, pff, 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 we have from Marion Macri. What do you think about Mate Cat's free cat tool? Ooh, are you? Mm -hmm. Have you used yeah. Mate Cat's free cat tool? <laughs> well, first things. Uh, first thing that I would like to mention is that uh, they have uh, wonderful mascots and wonderful uh, blue cats. Oh my God! I work. don't. I don't think anyone in the industry. I don't think there's anyone in the industry that doesn't have one of those little blue cat keychains, like exactly. stu <laughs> stuck underneath their car somewhere. So well, yeah. I, I well, as it happens, I don't, <laughs> but uh, I saw them, and what I actually had was some kind of experience with Made Cat uh, back in the day when I was more involved in the managing of translation projects. Um, it was not like a you know like a. a top-notch, brilliant, uh, and best-in-class experience, but uh, it was uh, okay for the purpose. And that is exactly how I think we should take the uh, free tools, you know, uh, that, uh, hey, they solve our uh, tasks, and uh, that's good, thank you for them. Um, it's kind of like uh, not in our position maybe to dictate what to, to, to do to these companies. What's uh, important here that MateCat is not the only product of that company. There are also other TMS um, systems there which serve different purposes. For example, they have uh, Translation OS that would be an enterprise focused TMS or uh, wonderful uh, tools, newer generation, uh, made sub and made dub. That is more of a audiovisual kind of tools. Uh, well, you can guess it, right? Like for dubbing and for subtitling. And uh, uh, these are like uh, very cool uh, because uh, they feature some of the newest developments in our industry. For example, uh, with, uh, you know, like translate automatic uh, dubbing of a uh, person in a different language. So, for example, I would be talking here now in uh, Spanish, which I unfortunately do not know, just like uh, with, uh, well, by means Yo of tampoco. some automation uh, of, of that company. Sorry, I, I, I couldn't resist, re resist a quick Spanish joke in there. I said, Yo tampoco. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Man, the thing I love about hosting hosting these things is I don't have to know anything. I can just invite smart people like Yulian to answer all your guys' questions out there. Uh, we have another one. I believe this is from Joshua Velasquez. Hey, Josh. Uh, can someone send – no, that's someone else. The cons of using a TBMS or translation business management solution in the long term is that if you eventually acquire a TMS to centralize your linguistic resources, you will feel some redundancies, for example, vendor and client databases. Any comments on that, Emilio? Oh, let it be. <laughs> let it be. Let it be. Let's move to the next one. Let I have, I, like, I cannot approve <laughs> nor deny what is said there. So I, thank you for your comment. Thank, thank you very much, Joshua. All right, let's, uh, let's take a look at machine translation up next here. Uh, we're cruising right along. So I don't want to talk a lot about machine translation, but really quickly, can you explain what are the options out there? What do buyers need to know? Specifically, what do new buyers need to know? What are people that have never purchased machine translation or never um, integrated machine translation into their workflows? What, what tips, what advice would you have on the, for them out there? And I'll pull up the MT section of the portal over, or the mm -hmm. Atlas over here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not exactly an advice, but um, just a comment that currently in 2021, we are in a much better position uh, than we were last year because more companies emerge on the market with the technologies that help um, us do the dirty work for us when, with regards to MT. By dirty work, I mean something that um, is actually uh, sometimes mm, considered very interesting, uh, such as machine translation evaluation uh, and uh, machine translation like uh, customization and training of MT engines. Um, uh, before, like uh, maybe five years from now, uh, your options as a newcomer to this uh, sphere would be to actually do it all by your own means internally if you are an LSP or an localization team inside a big enterprise. Um, so uh, now we have uh, great MT aggregators. Um, sorry if it sounds like uh, <laughs> a little bit 
uh, not enough to, you know, describe how many wonderful features these companies and technologies have just in aggregate. Like, huh, does it only connect like uh, machine transition engines to one place? Well, uh, a good TMS can do it. So no, uh, actually MT aggregators have something more uh, to offer uh, in addition to just connecting you with the uh, machine transition engine. For example, that would, that would be the automatic prediction of uh, machine translation quality or uh, automatic estimation uh, before actually uh, translating something. So the feature that is called machine translation auto select or how Intento is very knowledgeable, of course, and known to every one company in this area. They have um, uh, the like MT uh, curation um, and for the uh, prediction of uh, which um, which engine uh, will be better for your particular domain, language pair and use case. Um, you can now use their technology not only like uh, in their just their environment, but also connect being connected to, for example, MemoQ. So you work in a TMS, you use intent of technology, and hey, you know what MT engine is best for you. That's that's uh, if you want to um, have it easier and quicker. Um, and as for customization, um, I would also like to mention here one uh, new uh, new company, uh, new kid on the block uh, from our friend. Constantine Drench. Hey, his, Constantine uh, Drench. Kostya. <laughs> yeah. Um, so his partner, Philip, uh, who, uh, well, are both originally Russians. Uh, Intento is also developed by, like, Russians. Hmm. I see a trend here. Hmm. But anyway. The, no comment. Uh, <laughs> no comment. <laughs> the the, the um, uh, company is called Custom MT. And uh, they really special, specialize in exactly the, uh, like, customization of uh, of MT. They also have uh, good information, good data available to everyone for like comparing different engines. But that is not an advertisement. Uh, it's just the uh, new key on the block that uh, I think we should be paying attention to. Because also they, again, as I said, they publish free research from where, for example, a newcomer, as you asked, uh, can find uh, answers to the questions like, how big of a data set I need to, you know, to really make the uh, profit out of my uh, MT customization efforts or like uh, which, um, I don't know, which again, like amount of uh, segments uh, is enough to show a better gain in a blur score, which is one of the many metrics you can use for MT, uh, well, etc. So this is uh, something new, very interesting. Um, very very yeah, cool. Uh, yeah, I just that's, that's it. Brought up. That's, that's why I say that like we are lucky. Now we have uh, more people, uh, more technology companies that help us with our MT journeys. Yeah, I mean we are we are not wanting for options out there when it comes to language technology. I mean, ten years ago, I couldn't imagine looking at the the technology atlas like this. It's just there's so many so many options coming up out there. So let's move let's move on here. Let's talk about interpreting and the fourth thing that we're going to talk about today. Um, RSI, or Remote Simultaneous Interpreting, really started booming in 2020 for, for obvious reasons. And I wanted to ask some questions. So, like, will demand for remote interpreting continue to rise? Will Zoom remain the de facto largest remote interpreting platform? I mean, Zoom, not even in language technology, but it is the de facto largest remote interpreting platform. What's next for the language uh, technology, or in specifically interpreting technology, like computer-assisted interpreting and machine interpreting? And to answer these questions, because Yulia is the world's foremost expert on language technology categorization, because she, we worked on this report, she worked on this report. However, that doesn't necessarily mean she's our full expert in all of the different technologies. So to answer these questions, we have a report submitted this morning, last minute, you know, getting it in by the deadline by Chief Researcher Sarah Hickey, who is our resident interpretation expert. So let's take a look at that, shall we? Research at NIMSI Insights. And I'm also her. the resident expert on anything now. to do with interpreting, okay. including virtual interpreting technology, which is one of the segments of our language technology atlas. 
Um, it should come as no surprise that remote interpreting has been booming since the onset of the pandemic. Um, because, of course, once the lockdowns hit, it was either no interpreting or remote interpreting. And one of the trends that stands out the most in this field right now is that Zoom has become the de facto largest RSI platform. Why does this stand out? Well, because Zoom is not a platform that has been built for multilingualism. It's not what they do. If anything, it's a very, very tiny portion of their business. But Zoom is just so massive um, before the pandemic already, and especially since Zoom has become the absolute number one video conferencing platform in the world. And so with that in mind, and keeping in mind that we humans are creatures of habit, um, it shouldn't be surprising either that the end users, the, the clients who uh, request interpreting services, well, that they like to use what they know. They want to work with what they know. They don't want to create a new login. They don't want to uh, learn how to use a new platform and train all their people. They just want to host their meeting on Zoom, but also have uh, interpreters there. So um, this became a bit of a challenge for the established um, remote simultaneous interpreting technology platforms in our industry, because of course they were built with multilingualism in mind from the ground up. And they do provide superior capabilities when it comes to the interpreters. So they have all the same features and functionalities that interpreters would have in uh, the real world rather than the virtual world. Um, whereas the RSI functionality of Zoom is very rudimentary. It works, but there are certain functionalities missing. But on the other hand, then Zoom has superior event functionalities. And yeah, well, especially if people are less versed in what's needed for interpreting, they tend to care a little bit less about that and more to have a successful event. So um, what does that mean for the um, language technology providers in this space? Well, they had a choice to make, and that was to either see Zoom and the likes as a threat and try to compete against them and get people to use their own platform or to, well, cash in on the trend, basically, um, in the form of integrations. So that is exactly what happened. The race for integration started. Um, in the beginning, those were very complex workarounds um, where both interpreters and clients had to use both platforms. Um, but over time, this has developed. And so exact, uh, at this stage, for example, um, Interactio um, has found a way to just take the audio from zoom and put it into their platform where the interpreters can uh, do their work and then feed the audio back so that means that the interpreters have everything they need to do their job but the clients just need to log into the zoom platform so this is significant progress um, same for interprefy as well um, they have done a proper integration now with microsoft teams um, so that microsoft teams clients can just install interprefy for teams and directly request interpreters um, through teams um, and the interpreters again work on the interprefy platform but the clients just need to use teams so this is significant progress and i'm actually excited to see um, how this will develop going further because in the end this is kind of the best of both worlds zoom microsoft teams google meet they provide superior event um, functionalities and people know and like them but you do want to have the RSI platforms involved to provide uh, the interpreters with everything they need to do their job well because ultimately of course that hugely impacts the outcome for the end client so combining both worlds is uh, ultimately the best thing so we'll see what happens there um, then the next thing to highlight, um, actually the buck doesn't stop here when it comes to <laughs> integrations. Um, we've also seen a huge boom in telehealth. Um, not too surprising with the pandemic. This was already on the rise before COVID-19 came around. But especially since, of course, um, well, doctors uh, try to avoid any in-person meetings uh, that were unnecessary. So... This gave rise to more needs for telehealth, and with that came um, increased need for interpreting um, on telehealth platforms. And so there was also um, new requests coming in for integrations of um, over the phone or vi especially video remote interpreting 
platforms with telehealth platforms. So um, we can expect to see more of that in the future as well. Um, another trend to briefly mention is machine interpreting. Well, machine interpreting may um, not be as developed yet as machine translation, but it has certainly come a long way. I didn't think it was going to be um, very realistic uh, that this technology was going to be useful anytime soon, but I was proven wrong. Um, we've tested a few different solutions and they actually work and can be used in certain situations. Um, they have often the option to have uh, the transcribe, so speech to text version or speech to speech. Um, there's still a lot to work out, a lot of kinks to work out, for example, when it comes to brand names and um, just proper names in general, or slang, of course. But in scenarios, especially where there was otherwise no interpreting, um, being able to understand the, the gist and have a simple conversation is still a step forward. And a few companies are working on taking this to the next level um, to go straight from speech to speech, meaning cutting out the written part in the middle that uses machine translation and just using the sound waves instead. Um, Google is working on that, of course, to no surprise, <laughs> and also a few companies from our industry. So that's one to keep an eye on. Last but not least to mention are Kai tools. Um, they are most interesting for the interpreters. Kai stands for um, Computer Assisted Interpreting. And those tools are basically intended to be some sort of AI booth made for interpreters. So um, this is technology that interpreters can utilize to create a glossary within uh, seconds. And ideally, um, when the technology is developed further, it should also be able to bring up names and numbers for the interpreters and have them converted properly, for example, um, Fahrenheit to Celsius or miles to kilometers, because of course, this is something that the interpreters also need to convey properly between the different languages and cultures. And that is uh, quite uh, difficult at times. So actually me as an interpreter, I look forward uh, to seeing um, what comes next in that area, because that really sounds incredibly handy to me. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that. Um, she's not here to respond to that. She's at a delicious German barbecue. Um, I'm, thank you for the bathroom break, though, Sarah. I really appreciate it. Any comments for questions for Sarah, please drop those in the comments. I did see that we got one here, which is from a LinkedIn user. Julia, I know it's Julia, though, because I have it open. Hi, Julia. Is there anyone who does remote multilingual live streaming in real time? So interpreting that doesn't happen in a vacuum on a different track where all sounds are removed, but overlaid with other audio sources, such as music, for example. And I can, you know, not that I know of, but I'm not the expert here. And I, I, I hate to put Yulia on the spot, but Yulia, <laughs> you're on the spot. Do, do, you know, do you know of anything out there? That, and do you understand the question? Uh, I think that the better person to answer to that might be our colleague and the yep. VP of uh, e-learning at NIMSI, uh, Belen, who is an expert in audiovisual um, translation and tools, of course. And accessibility, so too. Because what, what you're talking about, Julia, in the comments here is largely an accessibility thing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But we've right. we've used Kudo and we've used Kudo over on the multilingual channel to do the, the summer series. And in fact, I just hosted a, a panel not that long ago on the role of certified interpreters. And it was amazing. We used Kudo and we had the, the deaf interpreters in there. We had um, so we had a deaf panelist and two deaf interpreter or two interpreters for the signing the signing interpreters and then at the same time we had the kudo system set up so it was being like simultaneously translated into like eight languages or something like that so it was really cool it was and here here we have it on screen um once again go over to multilingual tv if you if you want to check that out it's a really cool episode but let's uh, let's uh, move on here. Thank you. Very very good question, Julia. I do encourage you to reach out to to us offline, and we'll get you the answers. Uh, quality management. This is the, this is the next section that that we have here on the 
the Atlas. Let me just pull it back up here. Mm-hmm. Yep. So quality management, I noticed here that within quality management, we have standalone auto QA review and evaluation and terminology management. So um, first of all, this is a little bit structured differently than it was last year, if I remember correctly. Um, so maybe um, talk a little bit about some of the changes that we made to specifically like groupings of terminology management and quality management. And also the question I wanted to ask is, really how far can quality be automated like what are the tools to automate quality what are the main challenges of automating a quality process and will we ever be able to get to a fully automated quality process thank you Uh, the answer to the first part of the question is very quick sorry tucker but we didn't make any significant changes there it was structured the same way Oh, you no. can check it out if comparing with the 2020 version of the Atlas, which I also produce. Um, I can only advocate for like why I add terminology management tools to this big red button <laughs> screaming quality. <laughs> so uh, that's because I believe that, and I was like educated in that way, that uh, terminology management is one of the crucial steps in uh, uh, doing a quality translation work. So that's why it says here. And also the terminology checks, the automated terminology checks are a part of the like a little bit upper subcategory about the like QA tools. So it all belongs together one way or another. But ultimately why we manage terminology like for uh, actually making a quality content. Uh, we can even talk about terminology management at the um, like at one language, at an enterprise scale, not necessarily even uh, diving into translation of it. And it still would be to preserve the, like, you know, the brand image, the uh, naming conventions, the uh, known terminology um, to make it consistent, to make users love your content and uh, read uh, <laughs> things that they expect to read about this or that functionality, etc., etc. So that's why it sits here. Um, and to like uh, answer the question about how far can quality be automated, I think we should subdivide it into two uh, <laughs> smaller maybe regions of questions or areas, because um, it depends on like what exactly uh, are we trying to automate, which part of the quality process. Because yes, we have quality assurance tools, for example, and then uh, review tools, another category. Uh, So the tools, uh, the QA tools, uh, what they do, um, they basically try to help uh, you with spotting the actual errors in the uh, already like translated files. Uh, That would be, uh, for example, producing the reports with the lists of uh, possible uh, issues that then a human being would need to check. For example, inconsistent uh, tags inconsistency between uh, like using of uh, uh, different uh, matches from the TM, which would result in uh, like doubles or duplicates, for example. Then um, general localization rules, uh, grammatical constructions, like uh, of course spelling, uh, something like uh, segmentation also, um, numbers, did I say numbers, <laughs> links, punctuation marks, extra incorrect spaces, trailing spaces, double spaces, etc., etc. I think, you know, uh, you can understand uh, um, where I'm driving it. So yeah. that is the QA tools. Uh, these are uh, not uh, in stagnation. This field is also like uh, developing. Um, and uh, this can be possibly automated in the near future to an extent where we would have less false positives or false negatives in these reports. Mm. Uh, if those are like downloadable reports, exported reports, or just reports online um, you know, in the you know like cloud QA tool, because now we have these kinds of uh, QA tools as well. So uh, will it come to a point where uh, a human will not be needed at all? Um, actually, I don't think so, <laughs> because uh, you will you will always need to to check what this what this uh, kinds of tools produce and this is just only only natural i mean uh, we can't uh, like uh, develop such kind of like full stack automation i would be very happy to be proven wrong (laughs) but uh, not in like the next five years i suppose 
Um, and then uh, that's, yes, that's the key tools, but this is just one part. And then the second mm. part is about the quality management, right? The, uh, the whole like uh, tools to um, actually help with the review processes. That would uh, mean uh, like collaboration maybe between the translation team, the review team, uh, the assessment of the work that the translation team has done uh, and uh, also some LQA procedures and LQI, I meaning linguistic quality assurance and linguistic quality inspections, what, what name you, uh, um, with scores associated with uh, the errors that the uh, translator or translation team delivered. In that regard, what can be automated? That's like that's a wonderful question because um, this this no last year, we have seen a new shiny uh, uh, product <laughs> by Content Quo, and I suppose that uh, maybe Kirill talked about that on on this show because he was your guest some time ago. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so that was the concept of uh, augmented quality management, and the, the the tool name was Ada. Uh, it made it to the final round of the Process Innovation Challenge 2021. <clears throat> uh, and uh, uh, what that Ada could potentially help us with is actually like automatically schedule uh, <clears throat> and launch quality evaluations uh, for the different teams that are uh, working on the particular uh, project. Um, that ADA would function based on the data that it collects over time, based on the performance of different performers, uh, and uh, based on the data, it makes some kind of like maybe predictions, uh, and then uh, also is uh, said to like be able to adjust based on this get gathered data. That sounds pretty interesting. Uh, what we totally have now, like for, for now, not in this product, but in some, uh, you know, like uh, fit for purpose uh, or um, all in one TMS, which you, uh, the concept that you actually Tucker, uh, named mm -hmm. earlier when we were discussing TMS. Um, oh. Solutions, uh, for example, like uh, uh, BWX, IO, everything is IO now, <laughs> uh, from DuraWorks, for example, uh, has like all in one uh, also. And thanks to Gabriel Fairman who demoed the solutions to us. So, um, uh, he showed uh, actually that their quality model also has this element where the uh, data about linguists' performance is uh, gathered over time and based on that, uh, the uh, environment can make the prediction, the TMS environment, I mean, um, can make a prediction to whom better assign this or that job. That also speaks to the question of like automating uh, the quality process and the quality evaluation. So that is another way of approaching this question. And a lot of interesting developments are here, basically based on data. Excellent. Excellent. That's, uh, I, I'm going to push on because I want to finish this in an hour. I think we scheduled an hour for this, so I want to get through this. And next on our list is TMS mark or marketplaces and platforms. And let's, let's not spend a lot of time on here, but what is a marketplace and what is a platform? And just tell us about this section. If I'm looking at this report, what can I expect to find in here? With pleasure. So the main difference between the two is that in case of the marketplaces, it's a self-service. I will in a moment uh, touch on that. And in case of like platform LSPs, it's not a self-service. You do not uh, involve with your performance yourself. There is the whole LSP language, uh, language service provider, sorry, infrastructure uh, to uh, help you with the translation tasks and the localization process. Uh, and for um, marketplaces, that's, uh, th there are actually different marketplaces in this section or subsection, I should say, but they are all about human resources. Uh, we have recently added like 10 more marketplaces to that category. The version two of these uh, Atlas 2021 infographics will be out pretty soon, maybe tomorrow, who knows. So uh, uh, all those marketplaces are, uh, actually marketplaces where you market for talents. So you approach uh, any kind of a marketplace, be it the voice marketplace or uh, like a written translation marketplace, you kind of post a job there, for example, or a job description, 
and then uh, it connects you with the better linguists uh, uh, or those who just want to participate in the project. Well, in general, it works like that. There are some, some deviations for some peculiarities in each pro project, each platform, but that's, that's how it works. And that is why we haven't included, for example, Tao's data marketplace, mm. Mm. because it's another type of marketplace. It's not about uh, people. It's about data. So that's, uh, that's something different. Makes sense. Well, thank you. Thank you for the explanation. That brings us into number seven here, audiovisual translation tools. So now we're turning our attention to audiovisual. Uh, many things that used to be frowned upon became accepted last year during the pandemic. Uh, one such thing is remote recording and remote dubbing. Um, you, you, get, you see voice talent popping up all over the place uh, with their home studios. You know what? I'm not even going to talk about it. Um, I'm just going to pose some questions here. How is o OTT or over-the-top streaming services like Netflix and Hulu um, and all of those, how is that changing the landscape of audiovisual translation? Uh, what are the implications on healthcare and telehealth platforms? Uh, do we see voice talent being forced back into the studios or is remote, remote recording here to stay? What is voice cloning that we talk about in this report? And to answer these questions, we have another report submitted by our colleague, our colleague, doc, Dr. Belen Garcia Agullo. My friend, Spanish pronunciation is horrible. I'm sorry, Dr. Belen. And um, she's NIMSI's resident multimedia globalization and accessibility expert. And by the way, she also is the co-author of a new book, Mujeres en la Traducción Audiovisual. You like that? You like that accent? Mujeres en la Traducción Audiovisual. And I just got my copy this week, and it looks super exciting, and hopefully we're going to have her on the show later on to talk about it. But let's dive right in here, shall we? Nahuyo, lead media researcher at NIMSI Insights. Unfortunately, I cannot be there with you, Tucker and Julia, discussing the super interesting language technology landscape. However, I wanted to contribute with this short clip to just comment on a couple of um, on a couple of topics related to my areas of expertise where I had the, the, the chance to contribute in the Language Technology Atlas, thanks to Julia. So thank you so much, Julia, for letting me contribute to the Atlas. Um, a couple of things like, like that stood out to me this year were related to dubbing technology, right? Dubbing has been a quite traditional industry, so to say, in the past few years, because it's it's true that it involves a lot of like creative work, and I mean, most people working in this industry are artists, right? Are voice talents, are artistic directors, are sound engineers that sometimes do amazing things with their with their hands. So um, I think um, it's been like a long journey until technology is kind of making his way in the dubbing industry. And this year we had a couple of things, for example, remote recording. Of course, remote recording is nothing new. It's been around for, uh, for many years, but remote recording specifically for the dubbing industry and specifically at the scale that we have nowadays is something completely new. So I believe that um, this technology will stay in the future of course, for certain use cases, because if people can go back to the studios, uh, let's be honest, it's, it's, it's easier for uh, voice talents. Probably the quality is much better because those studios are soundproof with high quality materials. The microphones there are high quality and so on and so forth. So people will go back to the, to the studio for sure. Actually, they are already in the studios in those countries where the restrictions are now much lighter. But I believe that remote recording, remote recording will stay for certain use cases and to add more flexibility to the dubbing industry. For example, if I'm an artistic director and I don't want to go to the studio because I need to commute for one hour and then for an hour, another hour to go to a studio, I can connect online and I don't need to be there physically because I'm not the one recording, I'm directing the voice talent. So that's a use case that people are already taking advantage of this technology. And also, for example, um, if I'm an actor or an actress and I went to the studio, I recorded, but then there was a line that was missing. 
and I have to record that. And I, in order to record one line with three words, I have to go back to the studio and I have to travel, I have to commute and so on and so forth. So instead of doing that, I can record that from home. Or there are also many actors investing in home studios, in real home studios, not like going into the closet and just, or put a blanket on top of it. But some actors and actresses are investing in, in home studios that are high quality and that meet these standards of the industry. In that case, why don't offer them the flexibility to work from home if they want to, right? So that's when it comes to remote recording. Then another thing that is quite innovative and it's like in many companies are emerging in the last few years is uh, synthetic voices. We've seen, of course, we, we all are familiar with Siri and all these synthetic voices that we have in, in our devices, right? But now technology, machine learning and artificial intelligence are taking synthetic voices to the next level. And we are having companies that are offering emotive synthetic voices. That means that a synthetic voice, in, voice not human voice, can have actual feelings, can interpret a line with actual feelings, with feeling happy, feeling angry, feeling scary. And sometimes the results are quite uncanny. You can still listen to the robot behind it, right? <laughs> the machine behind it, but we're getting there. Another thing that is quite amazing and many companies are, are doing that at the moment as well with artificial in intelligence and machine learning is voice cloning. And what's voice cloning? So basically what that means is that I, for example, can record a few lines with my voice in Spanish, for example, which is my native language. And then the machine, the technology will take my voice and make me speak in different languages, but with my own voice, uh, with the proper int intonations and so on and so forth. I think uh, this is quite exciting. At the same time, technology is not quite there yet to substitute uh, anybody in the in the dubbing industry and probably it won't be there will all we will always need uh, humans in the loop because you know you cannot um, take the human factor when we're talking about interpreting right but there are certain use cases where this type of technology could be used uh, such as, for example, I don't know, maybe not for a movie at the moment, but for e-learning content or for a commercial or for other type of content that might require a different uh, type of user experience for our end users. And um, finally, I just wanted to comment that in general, in all these advances, all this technology, everything that's going on, it's in, in, in part due to the big streaming companies, OTT companies such as Netflix, Hulu, uh, Disney Plus, and so on and so forth, because they are bringing so much content, so much video content to the industry that the use of technologies is becoming crucial in order to scale. Uh, otherwise, uh, things are going to be very difficult and uh, everything is going to be very difficult to manage. So using things such as remote recording solutions or synthetic voices might help everybody um, cope with the increasing demand of video content. And also thanks to companies such as Netflix, we now also, because they are very active in creating guidelines and standardized pro processes. And I believe that in the past, most companies did not collaborate, like media localization companies did not collaborate in, in creating like solid workflows and processes. And now due to the amount of content that they are receiving, there's a real need to collaborate and to work together and to use technology in order to thrive and in order to survive in this industry. Those are my, my two cents. I hope you're enjoying your conversation. See you around. Bye. Bye, Belen. Thank you very much for that. And hey, guys, it is 1129 Pacific time. We are going over time. I do apologize for that. Are you okay? Yulia, do you have a hard stop? Can you hang out for 15 minutes? No, months? sure. Let's continue. But I have also a suggestion, like, um, as Belen is our the, like, the go-to expert with all things voice, audiovisual translation, and also speech recognition technologies, such as transcriptions and captions, 
we may actually skip that discussion <laughs> because I won't be able to, okay. you know, to contribute as much as she could. So yeah, that... we can move on to the section, the next section that was on your list, for example. Yeah, that's fine. There, there is a fascinating world of text to speech, so TTS and speech to text SST, and there's a fascinating world of how that's being trained um, and how um, audio and written, I would say, modalities are relate to each other and how they don't relate to each other. And how to train engines with voice, how to train engines with text, all, all of that stuff and translation. But for another time, let's get on to the last, the last section here, which is integrators. Integrators. Um, Yulia, what can you tell me about the integrator market? Um, is it, it, it seems to me like it's relatively new, but um, I could be wrong. Has it been there for a while? Um, has it been underground? Um, where has it been? Uh, how, how do you see this market evolving, this market that's evolved or come up with companies that are just focusing on integrations and stuff like that and automations? What, mm-hmm. What's the future of this? Uh, I'm, I'm putting my foot in my mouth here. Talk to, me, talk to me about the future of the integrator market. Is it a real market? Can it sustain actual companies? Um, that's what I want to know. I believe so, yes. Um, also to, uh, you know, like as we just discussed, uh, if you have any questions on audiovisual translation, you go to Belen. Uh, when you think integrators or when you say integrators or integration, you think Ishtan, right? Another colleague of ours. Right, so, right. So uh, his, totally. uh, his company, Belezi, is uh, one of the, like maybe a first who uh, said or which said that like, hey, we do that. We help you run your processes. We integrate uh, systems like uh, building connectors for you and basically connecting the dots. So you asked me about like, um, where was this market just, before? Just give a quick, Is it a market? quick, quick plug for be lazy here because I can, yeah. um, <laughs> because Ishvan is a friend and the Nimsy. Nimsy member here. So yeah, Be Lazy does some really interesting stuff. I highly encourage you guys, if you're watching, check check them out. Sorry, Yulia, for interrupting. Be Lazy dot cat, C-A-T. All right. Yes. Uh, no, not at all. Back I mean, like, uh, it's great that you showed that uh, information, that piece of information is very important. And uh, to continue, like, about the market, right? Is there a market for that? Uh, again, funny coincidence. Uh, well, maybe not exactly funny, but still a coincidence that um, exactly today I have found out about a new company that also does that. I will not be able to like name them now because it's not yet like uh, the public knowledge. But uh, this means that uh, more uh, players emerge in this area. Why they do that? Because of course there is a demand. Uh, let's imagine a typical um, enterprise uh, which has a lot of content to. Uh, like publish, create, and eventually translate. Uh, This big enterprise would have like many systems, many systems in which this content is actually uh, being uh, developed, if we can say it like that. Now that would be CMS systems, uh, one or two TMS kind of systems, because they may have, for example, the uh, like one TMS for uh, maybe documentation and marketing content, and then a completely other for just software strings, completely different solution. Or they would uh, use a third one for, let's say, web proxy and web, uh, web uh, translation proxy, sorry, and web translation, translation of web content. So um, a lot of TMS, uh, a lot of CMS, um, how we make sure that, let's say, our um, content gets consistently like uh, translated in all those uh, systems? Or how do we make sure that we leverage the things that we have already translated? Or how do we preserve our terminology? How do we make it really like consistent throughout the whole uh, content publishing uh, system which we, which we have? Uh, so with that, uh, the need for process automation and integration actually and connecting different system is, is of course, required. Um, modern TMS solutions offer you all sorts of connectors. These are priced differently. Um, and uh, this is like a whole other topic, connectors to different CMS uh, in a TMS. Uh, so yes, they can do it. 
But again, imagine if you have several TMS or if you're an LSP working for multiple clients, that's your case. You will mm -hmm. more, most likely have yeah. like to uh, muster several different TMS. Uh, LSP is not every client yeah. works. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, yeah. LSPs don't get to pick their TMS. <laughs> yes, yes. They get their yes. TMSs picked for them. Well, some LSPs do, and again, lucky, <laughs> lucky they are. Yeah. But again, let's imagine that uh, they have some clients uh, for whom uh, they need to like translate um, in uh, um, in the needed TMS, but derive content for that actual TMS from a customer's CMS, for example. So, uh, mm. how mm -hmm. uh, to make that possible? Yeah. Again, integrate and connect. Um, and uh, another use case, uh, quite, you know, like maybe it's a niche uh, thing, but uh, <laughs> since uh, I know of that a lot, uh, I might just uh, go ahead and share. Uh, for example, an LSP uh, or a linguist, uh, like smaller team uh, who are subcontractors for MLVs, for multi language vendors, uh, for big companies who translate into like dozens of languages. Well, imagine that uh, tiny LSP, let's say in Russia, would definitely have uh, like some need to connect to also the data about those translation projects, uh, which is stored in several different systems of those MLVs. Hmm. And this data should be connected and uh, stored in the uh, like one single environment, unified environment on the side of that LSP that smaller player. So uh, connectors to larger MLVs are also uh, a question and I have uh, heard and actually I know for a fact that Belazy uh, helped a couple of companies with that as well. Uh, with, mm -hmm. let's say, integrating the internal system that we localize and known uh, MLV uses with um, um, whatever needed to be with whatever it needed to be integrated with but basically uh, yes again to uh, make the flow of content and associated data easier for all parties involved and to well spare a lot of a lot of time uh, to all the uh, players in this in of this game um, and uh, to final maybe a final thought on the on the integration uh, subject here because we're short in time we're already over time uh, um, we're already over time might as well just yeah. take our time at this point yeah so uh, the final thought here is that the integration is uh, one of the key words which um, is being discussed <laughs> or, or brought up uh, in multiple conversation with like NIMSY clients um, and also of course the lazy clients and uh, whatever uh, because that's what we are possibly moving <laughs> into that's what we want uh, so preferably for example uh, for terminology management uh, one should have a unified terminology management system where uh, all the again players could have the easy uh, access to the correct terminology with the right statuses of for the terms and all the comments and concepts and context etc um, because like yeah uh, translators have their own terminology in let's say tms but then uh, developers have their own glossaries uh, stored somewhere else as i have just read in another chat you know like uh, uh, devoted to game development uh, that is not uh, a way to go <laughs> so we need some some kind of an uh, automated unified integrated all things integrated system to um, help us you know all collaborate uh, with all things content not exactly even translation so yeah uh, it's 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 uh, you know it's inevitable that this <laughs> this market will grow because we are seeing more and more technology companies uh, last year we had like 660 this uh, year we have 770 actually almost 800 now last time I checked so, uh, uh, of course, there would be the need to, you know, to it's a lot. Uh, at least something yeah. in order to make it work. 
Yeah. I, I know that when I, like when I teach courses and so I used to have like a, a, not a workshop, but like a lesson, a lecture, I suppose that I would teach on integrations. And it, I would tell people like when I'm evaluating a new technology, I don't care if it's a new chat tool. I don't care if it's a new TMS. I don't care if it's a new ERP. The first thing, like when I go to their website, the first thing that I click up at the top isn't the about us. It's not the clients. It's not the solutions or the pricing. The first thing I clicked is the integrations. And it means, you know, people say it different ways, integrations or partners or out of the box. And I'm looking for those out of box integrations because I don't want to mess around. I remember 10 years ago is like you were hip slick and cool in this industry. If you had an engineer that could come like you had an API guy that could come in and integrate stuff for you. But nowadays like people don't want to mess around with that. People just want stuff that works. People want it, you know, out of the box. And yeah. So Thank you for reporting on that, Yulia. And it brings us to, like you were talking about, people needing data so that they can make better better decisions. And that brings us to the next part of this report that I would be remiss if I didn't show this. If you go to the report, and we linked to it in the LinkedIn event down below, and you go down here to access the downloadable Google Sheet. The report is great. So first of all, but let's talk about the language industry landscape a little bit. There's three things you need to know about. First is the infographic, the picture. It's awesome. We all know that. We all know that. We all love it. The second thing that not a lot of people realize is there's a full report that's written um, there. And it, it really does provide a nice a nice summary of, of the landscape here in 2021. And the third thing that I want to look at here is the... Um, downloadable Google sheet, this downloadable Excel file here. So if you are less of an infographic guy or gal and more of a spreadsheet and workbook kind of guy or gal, then this is for you. Um, all of these different um, companies are linked. So it is just an endless supply of awesomeness. So I, I wanted to show that to everybody and let's, you know, Take a go back over here to the chat and check in on the guys. I've been kind of monitoring it. I've been responding to a few of you while while Bill Lynn and Sarah were talking. Um, thank you very much, everybody that participated in chat today. Give yourself a big, big, big round of applause because this has been our most successful episode so far of Nimsy Live. And I guess hey, it probably helps the fact that we actually planned for it and, you know, put it on the schedule instead of just doing it as a pop-up like, like we used to, right? So I have one question left that I would like to end with, Miss Yulia, and that is with all that is going on in the language technology landscape, every, everything that we've talked about today, everything that we've looked at, um, it, it is complicated. There's a lot to know. There's a lot going on out there. What is the role or is there a role for specialized consultants to play? How do companies, and I'll just, just put it out there, how do companies like NIMSY, who specialize in reporting on this type of technology and helping clients implement this type, type of technology, how do people like NIMSY, how do individual consultants, there's a thriving market for individual contributor consultants out there that are experts in their field on this what is the role for them to play in the future moving forward? Is this yet another service provider that buyers have to deal with? They're already dealing with LSPs. They're already, now they're dealing nine times out of 10, they're dealing with an LSP and an LTP, a language technology provider. Is, are we seeing the rise of specialized language consultants in our industry? Um, I think you answered that one. You said that the market is thriving. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I would like to answer about the role. And uh, again, I'm uh, happy to quote a knowledgeable person who is not me. Uh, I very much liked the idea that our marketing guru, Nika Alaverde, who also always kind of stays in shadows uh, or regularly stays in shadows, but she like oversees Nika, all, uh, Nika all, all the marketing. Yeah, Nika yeah. Alaverdi is the localization industry's best kept secret. That's all I'm going to say on that subject. Okay. Okay. So uh, what she said, basically, uh, this is the map, meaning the Atlas, right? This is the map. Let us guide you through the journey. And uh, it like is that. not just like only about the list that you showed or the picture. 
right, you know, or the downloadable report. It's, of course, um, if we really want to help people make use of this research, it's, of course, more important not how many tools are there, but which tools are exactly fitting the purpose of a particular customer, mm. be it an enterprise or an, or an LSP. And as a consultant, uh, like Nimzi can and does ask questions about uh, and help people solve questions about um, like what exactly is required, uh, what to oversee, what to pay attention to, what to know in addition to what is, you know, like written on the website of that particular L2P, as you called them. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, what is the competition, of course, uh, with, with what uh, it all integrates and how. And uh, also a very important part of that is uh, re-evaluating the internal process that this customer has uh, uh, like in place because uh, it may happen as it always not always but very often does that uh, before actually changing the tools some kind of uh, adaptation of the processes is required um, on the uh, like on the actual existing mm -hmm. workflows that that company has already like, uh, established so uh, change management very important topic which always comes into the conversation when we talk about uh, switching between tools or just selecting any new tools from the language technology landscape. I couldn't have said it better myself. And that's why we have you. Everybody knows I couldn't say it better myself. I'm not breaking news on that one. Anyways, Yulia, I think, I, I, th I think we made it. I think we, I think we got all the way through the language technology atlas and uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your insight. And thank you, for, not just for your insight, but thank you for all of the work that you do here at Nimsy Insights. You are truly the, the queen of the universe when it comes to assessing language technology. And, and I don't know what we would do without you. <laughs> so thank you for the work that you do. And thank you for the work that you do for our clients here at Nimsy Insights. Thank you very much. That's flattering. Uh, and uh, I really enjoy that. Uh, um, and also... I would like to like say thank you everybody who participates in our research, in our uh, surveys, in uh, mapping all that together, in providing the data timely, and making us uh, like <clears throat> learn more about the amazing technology solutions that you develop. All right. Thank you very much, Yulia. Once again, I, my name is Tucker Johnson, and you just experienced NIMSY Live, where we talk about the latest and greatest in translation, localization, internationalization, culturalization, and all that fun stuff that global companies need to delight their international customers. Our tagline is Real Talk with Global Thought Leaders, and we invite guests like Yulia Kukova, who like to have fun and also like to add value for our audience of globalization professionals. So please keep us honest and let us know what you'd like to see more of on this program. And if you have anyone like you'd like to see as a guest, let us know so that we can reach out. I appreciate our guest today, Yulia Kokova, who discussed the main categories, the nine main categories of language technology and what we need to know about each of them. I appreciate you, our, our listeners, and the people that joined us. I appreciate your comments, questions, and criticisms, and I look forward to next time. <laughs>